the Jaguar F-Type. Now this car to me, as I'm sure Mark is gonna bring up in this video many times, is kind of one of my God cars, blending the perfect mix of truly drop dead good looks, one of the most incredible automotive soundtracks, period, and the fact that this thing just gets underneath your skin to drive. And because these cars have been out for almost seven years, the prices are starting to come down to the realm where people can actually afford them. And with its fairly disappointing recent refresh, we thought it was a good time to visit this car. So in this video, we're gonna be talking about some of the development history behind this product, the engineering that went into it, and what this thing is like to drive. So with that, enjoy the video. <laughs> The interior of the F-Type in typical JLR fashion is kind of a mixed bag. However, before we start talking about this car in greater depth, I will mention this. In the 16, 17 model year, there was a pretty substantial mid-cycle refresh of this car when it came to the interior. At its core, it was the same. However, they did update the drivetrain and the infotainment. So the first thing to talk about when looking at the F-Type is which model do you want? Do you want the convertible or the coupe? And from the interior perspective, they're basically the same minus some of the practicality. The coupe is a hatch, which means the trunk is about the size of what you get in say a 718 or a Cayman, meaning you could use this every single day. The convertible, not so much. It's more in line with say an LC500, which is fine for say a trip to the golf course or a weekend jaunt, but really you're gonna probably struggle using that every single day. Moving on from that, if you're a larger person like I am, six foot tall and about 215 pounds, you will fit in this car pretty well. And if you're smaller, obviously this thing is gonna feel enormous. However, once you get to like the 6'3 mark or taller, you will struggle. The seats in this car are superb. They look good, they feel good, and because this is a R Coupe model, it does have the fully optioned out seats, which means you get Porsche levels of adjustability, meaning however you want, these seats can contour to your body. JLR does a good job designing things from a visual standpoint, and their leather work has always been superb. This black leather with the red contrast stitching does feel expensive and look expensive. However, a lot of the finer points when it comes to plastics feel straight garbage can, and that's JLR for you. All of the plastics around the shifter, the cup holders, the rubberized grips, all feel extremely cheap. And that's honestly a huge disappointment because at its core, all the driver inputs are superb. You have great visibility, the steering wheel feels great, the pedal box is easy to use, and all of the car's core functions, infotainment, HVAC, and drive modes are also physical. The infotainment in this car is dated. As I mentioned earlier, it did receive an update, Bluetooth and USB audio. The navigation is subpar even in the newer models, and the Meridian sound system is Pretty good actually for a car like this. It's about on par with say the Bose system in a 911. It's not great, but again, that's not why you're buying this car. Now with that, let's head to the shop and put this thing up on the lift. Underneath the 2015 Jaguar F-Type, and a big thanks to the owner who supplied us this so I can finally get Jack the gorilla off my back. He's always been ranting and raving how amazing this car is. So now we get it out of our system and we can move on with life. <laughs> so how much was this car new? 117. Okay, and how much did the owner pay for it? 48. 48, five years removed, right? With only 9,000 miles. Holy shit. The, so, the convertibles are even cheaper, Mark. Wow. They're like 35 grand with a V8, which is a joke. Yeah, and if you get this with a warranty, obviously this is in that attainable price range. And we're kind of going to discuss all the stuff that went into it, why it's relevant today, and why you would maybe want to own it. So tell me a little bit about the history. So this is an Ian Callum designed car. And Ian Callum did a lot of quite iconic English sports cars like the Aston Martin Vanquish, the DB9, the Jag XK, the Jag XJ, XF. F-Type, basically every modern Jag in existence at this point, he has had his hands in. Okay. And this car was a concept car he originally designed in like the 2011-2012 time period called the CX-16, which then later became this F-Type. And if you look at the two, they're very, very similar. And this car was supposed to be a throwback 
to the E-Type, its spiritual successor, a two-seat roadster that was about GT touring that you could drive in a sporty fashion. And he always felt that Jag needed a two-seater in their lineup, and it needed to have a connection to the past cars. So when you look at the exterior, which we don't typically talk about, there is that connection there. If you Google all those cars, there's this slight manipulation resembl resemblance that all of them have. It is a classic look. This is one of the best, most elegant looking designs. And probably it will find. age well too. It, it has aged in the past seven or whatever, how long it's been out. It still looks relevant today. Yep, and the base architecture of this car is a heavily revised version, which you found on the XK, which is the prior coupe to this. Which is no joke because this is, I think you were telling me, it's all aluminum, the body structure? Yeah, it's an all aluminum monocoque body structure. All the body panels are aluminum, and this is in fact, at least when they designed this car, 30% stiffer than anything else JLR had at the time, which again, they don't make sports cars, but that's significant. For a GT car, you have all forged aluminum control arms, front suspension, your subframe is also aluminum. In the front. In the front, correct. The brake system, the brakes are just a solid face rotor. They are not a two-piece design. However, there's no dust shield on the back, which means these little tacked on air directors here will help cool them significantly. And this did get a carbon ceramic option, which stay far away from. Yeah, it's, a, it's an expensive option. And don't forget, Mark, this is a double wishbone front and rear. Okay. Now, I think the last thing to talk about here, Jack, is this has a ZF automatic, an eight speed, yep. and there were other transmission options as they've evolved this car. Yeah, so they did some modifications to the ZF gearing based upon what engine option you add, because you could have a four cylinder, two variants of a six, and three variants of this V8, all making different horsepower figures. But for a short period of time, which of course in traditional fashion, we asked for it, we didn't buy it, and they killed it off, you could get a ZF six-speed manual in the supercharged six-cylinder. Okay, so that's good to note. In the back, Jack, I thought you said this is all aluminum. What's all this rusty junkyard stuff on the back? Well, Mark, this is a JLR product after all, and because they're owned by Tata, Tata decided to supply some of the steel on this car, and they, they just did a bang-up <laughs> job back here. It's just tremendous. So this car only has 9, 12, like yeah, 12,000 12, miles. miles. It was obviously driven in the Midwest, and these frame braces and subframe is already rusting. So what's the deal? So there was, and this is not something JLR will admit to, but if you get on the forums, apparently they did not properly nickel coat a lot of the steel components. And again, this was not a JLR supplied component. It was their parent company, Tata, who if you know anything about is enormous, they have tons of money and they're Indian. So they decided to skimp on some of the undercoatings yeah and assume that people aren't going to ever have this in salty weather <laughs> <laughs> so, which is unfortunate yeah. but it is because it's tarnished uh what would be a great car so they did issue a tsb for replacing some of these things however that does not cover you if you're out of warranty or if the original owner like this owner never did any of the tsb work which again that's the problem with buying a used car right so something to know other than that we have the back i noticed in the front this is one of the absolute few street cars I have laid my eyes on that has stainless steel brake lines that are factory. So the front and then the back has a hard line that's connected to a really short run of stainless steel lines. They look like Goodridge lines, but I could be mistaken. And everything else in the back, however, you have all aluminum suspension and, you know, basically what you typically see. Now this exhaust is super loud. Uh, it's a Tenneco exhaust, but it looks like shit. It looks like, I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it clearly makes a lot of noise because there's no sound insulation or any anything. I'm it. pretty sure the story goes that when JLR was approached by the government and asked, does your exhaust meet our noise regulations? They just lied and like, oh, yeah, don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. But here's a couple other things to bring up. So as we talked about, this car has been out for a very, very long time. So they made some running changes, most notably to the V8 cars. So early ones like this are rear wheel drive. However, probably because owners were stuffing them into trees, the 16 and later cars, including the SVR, which if there's a viewer out there with one, we'd love to do a video on it, um, is all wheel drive. That is rear biased all wheel drive. Okay, the next but it's not nearly as slidey as this. Oh God, no, this thing as we're about to show on the drive is basically my favorite car in the world. Oh, okay. Well, this mark is like, you know, it's like a Hellcat that can read, right? Okay, I mean, yeah. it's, a, it's a more sophisticated car that you don't feel bad about but driving. But the new one's also quieted down the exhaust, correct? The 2020 and up, the new refreshed car, got away from some of the original character of this. And lastly, the differential in the back. 
So V6 cars and four-cylinder cars had a torsion diff. However, all the V8 cars, both coupe and convertible, went to a ELSD, which is a clutch pack rear diff, which you know obviously allows them to modulate what it's doing a little bit better. But if you do decide to track this car, they are famous for overheating the rear diffs. You wouldn't track this car. Don't, there's no point. These are GT cars at their heart, and you know your running costs would be so high. But this is basically an LC500 in your world, and we've always is, talked about yeah. that. It is. It, like Jack's always told me, this is like the LC500 was the spiritual Japanese successor to this car, and while it's not as uh, ragey as this, <laughs> that you definitely see the parallels. So if you're somebody that's looking for that type of car, and the buy-in for this is almost nothing. Yeah. So with that, Mark, let's head underneath the hood. Sounds good. Well, we know we're under something special. It's got a hood that goes up the wrong way, Jack. Yes, this is an all aluminum clamshell hood mm -hmm. with some steel rivets that like the underbody are also <laughs> rusting. rusting. But, so what you have here, Mark, is a five liter V8 with a TVS style blower. It produces in the Coupe R variant, 550 horsepower. And this is the interesting thing about the F-Type. Your mileage may vary based upon what model you had. They had a four cylinder, which you shouldn't buy. You had three Did you just say they have a four cylinder yes, in this car? Which completely ru ruins the F type. <laughs> That's like, I don't even <laughs> want to say it. I'll get myself in trouble. Anyway, go ahead. All right. So then you have three outputs for the V6, which again, this car came out for, was out for a while. So you had a 340 horse, a 380 horse, and then a 400 horse variant of the V6, which most people consider the driver's car variant of this. It does drive in a more balanced fashion. And it still sounds spectacular. And you could get it with a manual. And then you have the 5-liter five liter, five liter AJ Series V8, which Ford built, much like they built their 3-liter V6 as well. The plant is going defunct here shortly, so who knows what's going to happen in this engine. But it's very stout. It probably has some of the similar roots to the 5-liter Coyote, even they won't admit it, just because Ford helped build this right. motor. And we are going to take a look at the weight balance right now, Jack. I'll it, put up the chart. It's a damn heavy car just by being aluminum. It's about 3,900 pounds. The cross balance is pretty decent. It's, you know, not perfect. Um, and then the front rear distribution, he said, was 52 front, 48 rear. Yep. Okay. Which is kind of to be expected in the yeah, big GT, it's a GT car. Like, this is a GT car. It's not a pure performance car. And but, you see that in the suspension tuning as well. Yes, like you can see in the top mounts, they are electronic dampers that are, you know, variable. And it's definitely on the softer side. You know, I noticed something else here. Why is there a little uh, little container here, Jack? Because the non-all-wheel drive F-types had hydraulic steering. In 16, they went to an EPS unit. Okay. So I'll be curious to see how all of that feels when we get this out on the road. All right, Mom. Oh, Bobby. You finally got in, got me in an F-Type. Yeah, Mark. What, what's, what's the deal with this, Jack? Well, as some of the viewers may know by now, this is one of my favorite cars. I'm going to demonstrate to you and the viewers, the boys and girls at home, why I love this thing right. so much. Oh, great. Here we go. this fast <laughs> is there something is there something rattling around in the exhaust no mark this is the uh the party piece of the f-type it's just it's like spinal tap turn all the way to 11. it has one of the best exhaust notes this is this is oh, this is a special experience and for the price you can get these cars at now, it is a no-brainer, for me at least, as a street car that is all about theater. And this engine, which of course you can't really use on the street that well, is incredible. It is such a special feeling car from a drivetrain perspective. You have great noise, you have a ton of power, and this ZF8 speed is brilliant. I mean, we always talk about it, it's really good. It's not special feeling, but it does exactly what it's supposed to. Yeah, so the, this has one of the best balances of every core fundamental that you want from a streetcar. It's fun, it's loud-ish, it, you know, it's not just about the noise. It's the ride quality, it's the transmission performance, it's fast, 
it looks good. I mean, I don't know what possibly else you can want, Jack, but I think you're gonna you're gonna show me something else. <laughs> it does that. Mark, this is like going on a date with an emeritus professor of like classic English literature and finding out her favorite pastime is lap dancing, right? I mean, and it certainly doesn't hurt that you have Walmart tires on here. He's got what, 500 Shredwear tires, which means you are always skating around. And when I first drove this, um, I'm, I, I thought there was something wrong with it because <laughs> if you hit, hit throttle at like 15%, you're losing the back end. and. Personally, yes, while it's fun for the sake of the video, <laughs> if you want to slide around do that, but this needs real tires. Otherwise, it just becomes a liability the colder it gets. I've spent a lot of time in F-Types over the year, as you've talked about. This is my god car. Yeah. And no, this by far has the least amount of grip of any F-Type I've driven. Most of them are on like Pirellis or Pilot 4S's. Right. And when you do it that way, you can have the balance between grip and sideways, which is for me in a street car, right? I mean, this is a deeply flawed product as we talked about in the shop. No, but it's it's amazing though. It, it just, I think the tires highlight how well balanced this car is. It feels really neutral. It's not out of control. Yet when you peg this in a straight line, it is remarkably fast. Yeah. It is super quick. And I think the biggest conversation with this car, its closest comp competition, the new competition, is now the LC500. So a lot of people ask, you know, how does this compare to that? From a dynamic perspective, I like the character of this car. Kind of like I was alluding to earlier, this to me is like the guilt-free version of the Challenger Hellcat, okay, right? Yeah. In the Challenger Hellcat, no one expects you to be able to read and everyone thinks you beat your wife. Yeah. In this car, at least you're likable. You know, it's this nice, it has a very sophistication. Sophist it, there's a high level of sophistication to it until you get out and drive it and you realize that's all a facade because when you start driving this. It's all about the engine, just like the Hellcat. Yeah. But it's comfortable, it looks good, and this thing rides really, really well. Let's talk about that for a minute because that's one of the deal breakers with cars like this. Uh, the When LC first came out, it was its biggest problem. It rode like shit. Mm -hmm. They kind of fixed that. This rides great. It's exactly what you want from a car you're going to drive every day. It doesn't get overly firm even when you put it in whatever it's sport mode for the dampers. This car always rides great. I love it. I, I didn't think that I, I would love this car, but it You've sold me. Yeah, this is one of the few cars that despite its... Despite its many flaws, it is. <laughs> it, it gets underneath your skin in a way that few cars do, right? The interior isn't that great. But despite all of that, this thing is affordable and it makes you smile in such an intoxicating way. Yeah, it's it's a hell of a car. And if it was 105000 no. But because this is a used car proposition, like our viewer bought this, mm -hmm. hats off to you, man. You just bought one of the <laughs> best cars I've been in this year. Yeah, it's amazing. Let's uh, get into the final thoughts, Jack. All right, Mark. Final thoughts. Maybe you'll be able to hear me over Johnny Arctic Cat over there who just has to rev his snowmobiles for three hours. That's what it's like driving the Jag to most people, I'm sure, when you sit and rev the exhaust and you deafen all your neighbors, it's one of the most exciting parts of driving the F-Type. Let's be real. There is a dying breed of rear-wheel drive, fun cars that are loud, brash, V8, and this has a supercharger, of course, so it adds the extra flair and power that you're looking for. But the main takeaway, and I mentioned this during the drive, every single part of it, from the steering is okay, the suspension is great, the transmission is really good. The power output is amazing. It's way more than what you need. And the fact that it can go from quiet, comfortable, old man mode to straight, just Neanderthal is what makes this so enjoyable to drive and be in. And it's that fun factor that just doesn't exist in too many vehicles. And there's only three that come to mind. You have the Hellcat, the LC, which is just a little bit more refined, and then there's this car. In the case of price range, finally, 
you can buy something for forty to fifty thousand dollars that gives you everything that you mostly want in a daily driver. This is one of the best cars I've been in all year, and I know it's older, okay? And you might wonder about the new ones. Well, the new ones strip away a lot of the sound. They go all-wheel drive. So they took something that was just animal mode into now you can't have a lot of fun. And this is why you buy this car. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.